we've been going through a series called what is God like and we've been looking at the attributes of God so today we're going to conclude that attributes uh, to conclude that attribute series with the title today um, in the attribute of God that's called the holiness of God say the holiness of God a holiness of God now first off I have to be really honest with you guys is that as I was preparing and studying for this message I realized one thing when it comes to the holiness of God I know probably little to nothing about it I mean, to be honest, and if I think about it in comparison to all the other attributes, whether it's love, patience, grace, sovereignty, all of these other aspects and attributes of God, we know a whole lot more of than we do the actual holiness of God. The holiness of God is something that really, if we're honest, very few of us actually know anything about. The love of God, we've experienced that, even if you're not a believer in here, you've experienced the love of God just personally because God's been good to you. The grace of God we've all experienced because we've all got away with stuff that we shouldn't have gotten away with. Amen? Amen. Amen. We all understand the grace of God. And even the sovereignty of God is something that we all understand too because how many of us have just uh, have, have desired something or something didn't work out but somehow God just allowed it to work out in the end. You're just like, man, God is really sovereign because it just all worked out for my good. I didn't even, I didn't even plan it that way. But we understand the sovereignty of God, and we all got stories about the grace of God. We all got stories about the love of God. But how many of us have actually have stories and real-life encounters with the holiness of God? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us have really been impacted on a regular basis by the holiness of God? His holiness is something that we know little about. Now, some of y'all wondering why I got this gigantic, gigantic orange right here. Um, well, I have been battling with a fever, so this isn't why well, I'm not going to be chewing on vitamin C all day long. But I did do this just for a quick little example uh, to hopefully explain the holiness of God. And I chose an orange. Oh, boy, I got a knife. Yes, I got a knife. This wouldn't have made it past TSA. But it's here at the church. Body security didn't work that well. But um, we, got, we got a knife right here. And I'm going to cut this orange as I'm doing so, right, as I'm doing. Okay, make sure. Cut the orange. If you separate the orange, and you literally have two oranges now, because I cut one in the middle and I separated them two, this is an example of what the holiness of God is like. Because holiness, by its pure definition, means to cut or to separate. And when we talk about the holiness of God, we are looking at God, right? You can say God is this, and man is this, and they are completely separate. Completely. God is not connected to man like that. Like, if I was connected, it would just drop to the bottom. It will just fall because they're completely separated. I chose an orange and not a watermelon because some of y'all would be stumbling the whole service. Who like, got watermelon? And I want to keep y'all focused, okay? Um, but the orange, okay? Once again, the holiness of God means to cut or to separate. This is a picture of what the Bible means when it says that God is holy. He is completely separated from anything that is unclean, anything that is dirty, or anything that is sinful. God is completely separated. Fundamentally, holiness is the cutting off or the separation of anything that is dirty, anything that is filthy, anything that is sinful. This is best seen in the picture of the tabernacle. If you have your Bibles, or you can look on the screen or on the Bible app to Exodus chapter 26, verse 33. Exodus chapter 26, verse 33. And this is what God gave them, gave them instructions, and this is what he's saying about the tabernacle. He told them this. He said, hey, there's a tabernacle. That's where my, whole, where my presence dwells. And then there's different rooms in that tabernacle. You got the, 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 um, the holy place, which is one, and then you got the most holy place. What I want you to do to separate the two, I want you, as it says in Exodus chapter 26, verse 33, is to hang a veil under the clasp and bring the ark of the testimony which is where God's presence dwells, right? And put that there behind the veil so that a veil may be separation between you and the holy place and the most holy place, or some other translations may say the holies of holies. So you got this this room, this room that is the holy place. And then the Ark of the Covenant, the the Ark of the Testimony, that is where God's presence dwelled. The fullness of his presence dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. And God said that I want this to be separated from anything that is evil, anything that is unclean, anything that is not like me. It has to be separated. So there's this huge veil, a humongous veil from top all the way to bottom that separated people from the holy place and from the holies of holies where God dwelled. Y'all following me? Follow me. So there's two rooms, right? 
And God says that nobody can enter into this room. And historians and Jewish scholars tell us that, in fact, that God kept the Ark of the Covenant hidden from everything and everyone. This is what historians tell us. It says it was hidden from view all times. Most Israelites, including the Levites, which were the priests, they never actually saw the Ark of the Covenant. The most holiest people among them were not holy enough for God, and and they never got to actually see the presence of God. It's like God said, no, I'm not having that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. I'll just read this. You guys just listen along. It says, but the high priest, which was the the, the guy that would intercede on behalf of y'all and intercede on behalf of us and God, it says that he would enter the second room, the holies of holies, and he does so only one time a year. And what he would do there, never without blood, because the shedding of blood is how you get forgiveness of sin. So what he's saying is, says, then he would offer sacrifices for himself because he's filthy. We all know that every pastor is dirty. Y'all say amen. amen. Y'all really believe that, though? If I, if I cuss, y'all will go crazy. Y'all will leave this church. <laughs> right? But we all know that every, every person is, is filthy, even the high priest. So he had to make sure that he did sacrifices for himself. So he offered sacrifice for himself and then for the sins of the people that they committed in ignorance. Imagine if that was my job. Like behind that veil was the holies of holies. And the only way I can go in there is if, okay, I got all clean, God, you know, all the stuff that I did that was super foul. Man, God, and that would take me uh, years just to confess my sins. And then I got to confess sins for all of y'all. Like I seen your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, all that. It would take me a long time. That's why it only happened one time a year. But, but this guy, he would go in there, and this place was so righteous. God is so holy that they would tie a rope around this high priest. Because if he did not confess his own sins fully, if there were still unconfessed sins in his thoughts or unconfessed sins in, in the things that he did and, and nobody knew about, but, but God knew about it, and he didn't confess those before God, they would tie a rope around this high priest just in case he happened to step into the holy presence of God with sin in his life. And he went behind that veil, and then boom, he was struck with the holiness of God, and and the holiness of God sees his sin. And you know what has to happen at that time? Because God is holy and he is not sinful, something has to give. Because a holy, holy God, by definition, can't be with sinners because he's holy. He's separated from them. So when a sinner walks into the presence of God, something has to give, and it's not God. It's that sinner that instantly, when he comes into the presence of a holy God, he dies. Can't handle it. God is too holy. And this gives us a whole new meaning when we look at verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. This, this, is, this, is, this blows my mind. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, it says, Do you not know that as a Christian your body is part of Christ's body? It says, So should Christ partake, should I partake of Christ's body and unite it and make it one with the prostitute? Because back in these days, the church of Corinth, they were, they were part of a culture that was really sex crazy. Like San Diego, one of the leading nations, one of the leading cities in STD rates. Our STD rates are much higher than the nation's capital. I mean, people, sex is nothing. It's like sucking a lollipop. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Absolutely not, the Bible says. You should not rec- re- unite Christ with a prostitute. So there's Christians that were going out there sex crazy. Absolutely not. Because he says, do you not know that anyone who's joined to a prostitute becomes one with her or him if he's a gigolo? Okay. Um, for scripture says, the two shall become one flesh. Verse 17. But anyone who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. If you say you're in here, in here that you're a Christian, you become one in spirit with God. His Holy Spirit lives in you as the scriptures continue to say. Therefore... It says the two shall become one flesh, right? Because anyone that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So you must run from sexual immorality. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you are brought with the price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. If you're a believer in here, you are holy because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Therefore, it is absurd, the Bible says, for us to engage with our bodies in sinful things because the Holy Spirit is in you. And holy, by definition, means separated from sin. We take the holiness of God for granted, though, that the Holy Spirit lives in us. It's just like, oh, no big deal. I'm actually kind of annoyed that the Holy Spirit is in me because it doesn't let me do what I want to do. We take the holiness of God for granted. 
as I was saying before, non-priestly Israelites and only a few of the priests every single year um, would, a, would, be, would be able to get a glimpse of the Ark of the Covenant. But even still, this is what, what Jewish scholars tell us. And even if they happen to be assigned to help the high priest in, in wrapping the transport of the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, it would only remain hidden from most priests either by a dividing curtain or a veil of the tabernacle or by the elaborate protectings, wrappings when it's transported. What the average Israelite could see at most at a distance and only when the Ark of the Covenant was transported were rings and poles. People never got access to the holiness of God. They never got to see the holiness of God closely. Why is that? Because God is what? Holy. He is separated from sin. Sinful people cannot be by him by definition. If we were, he would not be holy. Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. Let's take a look at this. Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. A man named Moses. Say Moses. Moses. This man is a man who wanted to see the presence of God. Moses wanted to see the glory of God, which is a crazy thing to ask for. But if you, if, you want, if you want to know God, you want to know who he's like, you want to see really who he is, and you should be like Moses. God, I want to know you intimately. So this is what Moses said to God. He said, please, let me see your glory. This is what God said. God said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, Yahweh, before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious to, and I will have compassion upon whom I'm, who I'm, I'm compassionate with. But he answered, God answered Moses and said, You cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Why? Because he's holy. And any of us holy? Praise God, nobody just tell me about to die right now. Somebody lying. <laughs> Psalms verse, uh, chapter 24, verse 3 says, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in this holy place? The one who has clean hands. How many of us have never done anything dirty with our hands? My gosh, I'm not shaking nobody's hand after service. Okay. How many of us have had a pure heart at all times, every single motive, everything that we do is 100% pure? Obviously, none of us. Who has set his mind on what is false? Who has not set his mind on what is false? And who has not sworn deceitfully? How many of us have made a promise that we broke? Every single one of us are not holy, but God is holy. Job chapter 34 verse 10 says that it is impossible, impossible for God to do wrong. Completely impossible. There are a lot of stuff that are impossible for me to do. I can't fly. I don't care how much R. Kelly thinks he can believe it, <laughs> Right? Like, and some people believe, like, if you just believe it, it's going to happen. There are some things, I don't care what it is, you just cannot do. <laughs> you can't fly. You cannot, okay? Don't try it. Don't try to prove me wrong. But you can't fly. And there are other things that some of us can never outbench Brandon Lamb, okay? <laughs> I don't care, women, how many times you try to get your swole on. And nowadays, I guess it's sexy for girls to be cut up. Uh, I guess. I don't know. But there's some things that's just impossible, Right? For some women to do, it is impossible for me to ever carry a baby and give birth. And I ain't trying to do that. Okay? <laughs> Never. So we have to understand there are some things that are just impossible for us to do. And there are things for God that are impossible. I thought God can do everything. Well, there's, there's some things that he can't do, like sin. God cannot lie because he is holy. For him to do so will go against all of his character. It is impossible for God to do wrong. It is impossible for the Almighty to act unjustly. So that means every time God is telling you to do something, it's always right. <laughs> that means every time you feel that unction to do what God is telling you to do, it is always the right choice because God is always right. He can never do wrong. This is what we're talking about when you're looking at the holiness of God. He is completely and utterly holy. The holiness of God actually appears 900 times in the Bible. <laughs> 900. <laughs> that is a lot of times to see and read about the holiness of God. The holiness of God is the chief attribute of all of his attributes. Even when you, when you when it's kind of like, you know, they say that you can take a person out the hood, but you can't take the hood out of a person. Right? If that person is ratchet, they're ratchet. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Right? I don't care if you send that person to Harvard, they're going to be ratchet. 
I don't care if that person joins synchronized swimming. They're going to be ratchet, okay? <laughs> if a person is ratchet, they are just ratchet. There ain't nothing you can do about it, okay? I don't care where you move them. I don't care how you try to re-educate them. They're ratchet. <laughs> now, when it comes to God, the holiness of God is who he is. If he's loving you, he's love in holiness, right? All of his attributes have been dripped, are, are dripping in his holiness, every single one of them. When we look at his grace, we may know grace because some of us may show each other grace. We're like, dude, I was about to give you a fade today. I'm going to show you grace, homie. Like, <laughs> like, okay, that's grace. But the grace of God is different because it's dripping in his holiness, though. <laughs> The love of God is different because it's dripping in his holiness. It's completely separated and different from anything that you and I ever know because he's holy. So my prayer today, you guys, is that we would truly get a glimpse of the holiness of God. Because the holiness of God, we can't look horizontal because it's separated from everything that we see horizontally. So if we're going to see the glimpse, uh, a glimpse of God, we have to look vertical and we have to look to God and only to him. Because only he is holy. We can't look at each other and say, oh, that's the holiness of God. Look at my dude right there. No, because God, by definition, is separated from everything that we see. That's why the Bible says that his ways are far above our ways. Why? Because he's holy. His thoughts are far above our thoughts. Why? Because he's holy. He's completely separated from all that we experience and know in this world. My prayer, once again, is that we get a glimpse of God's holiness. 722 years before Jesus Christ was born in the manger... There was a man named Isaiah. Say Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah is not my son, obviously. This dude, 722 years before Jesus came. There was a man named Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he tells us about his story of when he got a glimpse of the holiness of God. And it completely changed his life. That's why my prayer for every single one of us, including myself, I start first with myself and then I go with y'all, is that I want to see God the way that Isaiah did. I want to get a glimpse of the holiness of God that I may be changed like Isaiah was, and then God used Isaiah to change a whole nation, a whole people, and ultimately the world, because we're still impacted by this man who saw a glimpse of the holiness of God. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. This is what he says in his journal. He's writing. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. <laughs> you don't read that too often in the scriptures. You don't. He is, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And then the Bible says that he was high and lofty on the throne. And that's, that's exempt, speaking of his power and his authority. I mean, there's a throne. He's sitting there. He's in control. He's the boss, right? And he is high and lifted up. He's not a little throne that's just on the floor right there. Like everybody looks up and you see God seated on the throne. This is important because the king just died. The king was the power. The king was a, was a ruler, but the king ain't here, but God's still here. God's still in control. He still got the power. He still got the authority. And then it says in the, in the train of his robe, which signifies his presence that was attached to him because the robe, everywhere you go in the temple, it was filled with the robe of God. So that means anywhere you went, you see his robe and you're like, wow, God's here. If you go into this room, you're like, man, his robe is still here. Wow, God is here. So um, Isaiah, when he saw God... He saw somebody who was powerful, filled with authority. He saw somebody whose presence was everywhere. There was no need for a king anymore. There was no room for a king anymore. God filled that place. The king died, but Isaiah basically, whose name means the Lord saves, is saying, God is here. He's filled with power. He's filled with authority. And his presence is here. Verse 8. I mean, verse 2. Check out what we see. It says, two seraphims, and they are angels, were standing above God. Each one of them had six wings, say six. Two that they covered their face with, and two that they covered their feet with, and two that they flew with. Verse 3, it says, and, and they called out one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the entire earth. If you're taking notes, you can write down that the holiness of God provokes praise and worship. The holiness of God provokes praise and worship. The angels, when they're, when they're looking at God and in his presence, they're not singing about how powerful he is, how yoked up my God is, though they easily could have. The angels, when they're seeing God for who he is, they're not talking about his omnipresence and how his glory fills every, I mean, and how he fills everything. They're not just saying about his, so much his, who he is in his presence, but they're literally talking about his holiness 
His holiness and his glory, which are almost synonymous with each other, and they are crying out to each other over and over that the presence of God is in this place. The holiness of God is what I see, and that is what has just enveloped my whole mind and everything, because when the holiness of God is present, everything else is irrelevant. Everything else is irrelevant when the presence of God is in the place, when his holiness is seen. And that's where I personally want to get to a point. I personally want to get to a point in my private life. I personally want to get to a point here in our corporate worship that when we're singing about the holiness of God, it takes us to a place where we see God's glory everywhere. When we see it, no matter where we go, right to the left, it's just like, oh, wait, God's holiness. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, we, you just can't, no matter where you go, the holiness of God is just hitting you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's when we're talking about the holiness of God. It is something that is not just confined to a worship service. But when we're worshiping, man, we should get it in because the holiness of God is here. When we're talking about the holiness of God, this has to be something that's more than just a song, right? Because this holiness permeates everything. The Bible says right there that the whole earth is filled with his glory. When biblical writers, particularly the Jews, when they wanted to emphasize something, they will repeat it three times. Say three times. Three times. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 tells us that they repeated the holiness of God three times. It says, holy, holy, holy. Understand, you guys, that in the Bible, there is no attribute of God that's ever repeated more than once. Actually, there's no attribute of God that's ever repeated, period. <laughs> it's all, you never read in the Bible, God is love, love, love. But what do we sing about all the time? God is love, love, love. Not that we shouldn't, because it's in the Bible for sure. You never see in the Bible that God is patient, patient, patient. God is forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. God is gracious, gracious, gracious. But usually when we talk about God, that's all that we talk about. We emphasize things that the Bible does not emphasize. Not that we shouldn't speak about it. But we should emphasize what the Bible emphasizes, right? Be smart if we did that. So, so the Bible, the only attribute of God that is emphasized in the Bible is his holiness. But yet it's the one that we very little talk about. Nowadays, as I mentioned, we tend to emphasize everything else. It's, if you do a Bible search on check any, any sermon and you type in the love of God, boom. Bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of sermons on the love of God. You go into a Christian bookstore, you want to find books on the love of God, boom, tons of books about the love of God. You want to find books about anything else, but when you type in the holiness of God, it's like crickets. Because <laughs> once again, to know the holiness of God, you have to truly experience it. You have to truly be like Isaiah, which is one of the few who wrote about it because he saw the Lord, right? You have to really know what you're talking about. You can't just... I don't know how else to say this, but you can't BS the, the holiness of God. You just can't. You can't fake it, in other words. Sorry, I should have thought that word earlier. You can't fake it. You just, you cannot. You can't fake the holiness of God at all. As a DJ, um, there's always a few songs that I just got in my back pocket. A few songs that when I know the party is getting lame and it's getting kind of whack, there's a few songs that I can always whip out and boom, their mama's dancing, grandma's dancing, everybody's dancing. Because I know these songs are just universal. They just work. I can play them nonstop. I can play them over and over and over. And I picture one day, if I was a DJ in heaven, which I want that gig. <laughs> I do want that. If I was a DJ in heaven, the playlist is, isn't really too long, though, because when we look in heaven, there aren't too many songs that are being sung. But there is one song that is constantly on repeat. There was one song that never gets old. There is one song that people don't get exhausted hearing about because it's that real, and it's a song about God's holiness. When we look at, at, at what the scriptures are saying in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, we see that the angels are saying, holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory. But the holiness of God, man, this is such a beautiful thing. And the only holiness of God is not just something that we're supposed to think about, not just only are we supposed to worship about it, but the holiness of God is also to be imitated. Say imitated. Imitated. If you have your Bibles, you can turn or you can see it on the screen. We're going to see that the holiness of God is to be imitated. This is clearly the application end of it. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 tells us this. It says, but the one who has called you to be holy, uh, it says, but as the one who has called you is holy, 
you are so are to be holy, holy in all of your conduct. Say all. All, not just part of your conduct, not just Sunday morning, not just when you're at church, or not just when Christians are watching you. You are supposed to be holy in all of your conduct. Why? Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Which brings us obviously to our present reality. Our present reality is that we live in a world that is ungodly. We live in a world that is unholy. We, we live in a world that is filled with unholy things. As we know, you guys might not know or know that the statistics in San Diego are pretty dark when it comes to it spiritually. Nine out of ten people do not attend church. We just know that. Pick nine out of ten people, not church-going people, but just nine, nine or ten people. Count ten people in your neighborhood. Nine out of ten of them, guarantee you, they don't go to church. Nine out of ten of your family members do not go to church. Nine out of ten people that you went to high school with do not go to church. This is not a holy place at all. As I mentioned before, the STD rates in San Diego are higher than the nation's average. When we look at um, the nation, the San Diego's population, 60%, almost 60%, are either agnostic or atheist. They either don't believe in a God at all, or they just don't care to believe in a God, period. We don't live in a holy place. That's what 2 Timothy says, speaking of the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 tells us, it says, but know this, and we all do know this. In the last days, it will be very difficult to be a Christian. It will be perilous times will come if you're a Christian. Why? Because people will be lovers of themselves, say amen. Lovers of money, say "Mm mm-hmm. We just know it. People will be boastful. They'll be proud. They'll be blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and what else? Unholy. We just know this to be true. The Bible continues and goes on to say, it says they will be unloving, irreconcilable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, pleasures, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They will hold to a form of godliness, but they will deny its power. The Bible says avoid these people. Why would the Bible go so clear to say avoid unholy people? Why would the Bible say avoid people that are unloving? Well, clearly, because your holiness is at stake. If we are to be holy, separated from everything that is not holy, how can we then be a people that immerse ourselves in wickedness and hang around wicked people all the time? Now, the Bible is not saying that, that obviously we shouldn't live missionally and seek to change people and seek to bring them the gospel. But as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 13 says, that bad company corrupts your good character. Bad company corrupts your good morals. So the, what the Bible in essence is saying is that if we're going to live missionally and be a light to the dark, then make sure that when you're in the dark, your light's still shining. Make sure that when you're in the dark, your light hasn't been blown out, or then what happens? You get overtaken by the darkness, and it's just all dark all around. So we should have people in our lives that are unholy. We should have people in our lives that are unloving. We should have people in our lives that are far from God, wicked, evil people for the sake of winning them to Christ. But if they're impacting and influencing you more than you're influencing them, you need to avoid them because your holiness is at stake. Romans chapter 1 verse 2 makes it very clear. Therefore, my brothers or sisters, by the mercies of God... It sounds like one of those old English terms, by the mercies of God, my brother. You know, it's just like, but it's just really serious because the mercies of God is real. And it's saying by the mercy of God, I urge you. In the Greek, it means earnestly plead or ask somebody. So, you know, it's like down on your knees, just begging them. I beg you with everything that's in me by the mercy of God. Take this serious to present your body as a living sacrifice. This is what Paul is telling the people that, in the, in the, that are receiving this letter called the Romans. They are telling God, they are telling, Paul is telling these people the same thing that God tells us every single day. And we notice if you're a Christian that God is begging you and earnestly pleading with you every single day to present your body holy and pleasing to God. Right? If you're a Christian, you know what that feeling is like. Every single day you wake up and you know God is pulling you and urging you to be more holy. To be more pleasing. Don't talk to people like that. It's not pleasing to God. Why are you watching that? That is not holy. Why are you entertaining that mess? That is garbage. I'm urging you to be holy and pleasing to God. Not only does God's word tell us that, the Holy Spirit tells us that. Paul, in this letter to the Romans, is telling us the same thing. Be holy and pleasing to God. 
Romans 11 tells us, it talks about this great gospel, and that's why that first verse says, therefore, because you have zero ability to be holy or pleasing to God if you first haven't put your faith in the gospel. Put your faith in the gospel. Now those who have put their faith in the gospel, therefore, I'm begging you by the mercies of God to not be conformed to this age. Don't be conformed to the world or to the culture. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. Every one of us at this present moment is either being conformed or transformed. All of us. Every moment of your life, you are either conforming more and more to the world and more and more to the culture. You are conforming your thoughts, your processes, your behavior, the way you dress, whatever you do. It's either being conformed to the world or it's being transformed to holiness and in a way that's pleasing to God. It's one of two things. Every moment of your life, you're either being conformed or you're being transformed. And this is the real battle of Christianity. This is the real battle of holiness, and this is the reason why Christianity at times can seem so impossible, because we know that there are so many pressures pulling us to conform. There are so many influences everywhere we go in life. Maybe it's your spouse. You're like, God, if this person tells me, my spouse, I don't care. I don't even call this person by their name. She, (laughs) if she don't act right, I'm conforming to my flesh. If he don't act right, I'm conforming, God. But we got this pressure, this pull It's either I conform and I act ratchet (laughs) or I transform and I act holy and pleasing to God. How does this take place? The Bible tells us right there, do not be transformed, right? Uh, Do not be conformed to this world. So we have to ask ourselves every single day, are we aware of the constant pressures, temptations to get us to conform to the world? Or... Are we being transformed by what? By the renewing of our mind. Repentance, which is renewing of the mind. To change differently how you think. That leads to transformation. Compromise and sin leads to conformation, right? If you compromise with sin a little bit, you are more and more conforming to the world. If you are repenting every single day, and repentance means to change the way you think about things. If you're repenting from shopping addiction, okay, you just, anytime you're, 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 you're having a bad day and you just want to make yourself smile, you go and hit the mall and swipe the credit card. And you want to conform, you want to, I mean, transform your mind, you have to repent of that. You have to first change the way you think about shopping. If you have a problem with the opposite gender, looking at them sexually and just looking at them as objects, you have to change the way you think about them. View that person as a child of God. As somebody who has been bought and created in the image of God, who God is is molding to holiness, and you are being used by Satan to conform them into worldliness. You got to think differently about the way you view other people. We need to be transformed by the way, by renewing our minds, because repentance leads to transformation. God has determined long time ago that the way to transform us is through his word. The way to transform us is to renew our mind by thinking differently. If there's a sin that you struggle with, search for that sin in the scriptures and change the way you think about that sin and look at that sin from God's perspective, not from your lust perspective. Change the way that you think. If you want to be transformed to live a holy life, you must change the way you think. You must, change, you must be born again. You must soak your mind in proper biblical teaching of the scriptures. You must change your impure thoughts with righteous thoughts. It's all about a renewing of your mind. You must download godly, holy, biblical information into your cranium, okay? Download it constantly so that what comes out, you'll get biblical information coming out and biblical lifestyle and activity coming out of your life if you download it in. God is urging every single one of us to be holy and pleasing to him. Your transformation to a life of holiness and pleasing to God begins when you renew your mind. And I think the first thing that you need to renew your mind, if you're trying to live a holy life and you, you realize, man, my ways are not pleasing to God. Because I know, I know when, I, when, when God was calling me to live holy, that was the first thing I said. I was like, God, me? You know everything, right? <laughs> then you know me, right? Like, you're calling me to live a holy life? How's that going to happen? 
And I read Psalms 19, verse 9, that says, how can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to your word. Same thing that we're reading here in the truth. The word begins to teach us right things, and we think differently. But one of the things that you have to first realize, if you want to live a righteous, holy life, you need to realize this biblical teaching of adoption. You need to understand that you have been adopted into a holy family by a holy God. Not me. You have You always identify with your worldly nature. You always identify with being born a man. I'm born a sinner, right? I'm probably going to sin again. That's us identifying with your worldly nature. You need to be born again into a new family where God, who is holy, is your father. Holiness is a household issue. 1 Peter 1, verse 14, we looked at 15 and 16, but the verse before says, as obedient what? Children. As obedient children, looking at the idea of adoption, right? You have been adopted into God's family. You are now God's child. You are now God's son and God's daughter. Do not be conformed, the same word. The only time you see this word conformed in the New Testament is Romans 12 that we looked at and right here in 1 Peter. Do not become like the culture that's anti-godly. Do not become conformed to the desires of the lust that are in you, the desires of your former ignorance. There's a way that we used to live, and every single day we're tempted to go back to that. Just being honest. Every single day, maybe the temptation is stronger than others, but every single day you are being pulled to be more like how you were before you knew Christ. But you're God's child now, the Bible says. Verse 15, but as the one who has called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. According to 1 Peter, we should not conform to our evil desires and be because we're sons and daughters of a holy God. As I mentioned before, when you put your faith in God, you are adopted into his family. And the most influential person in a household is the father. Whether he's present or not. I'm telling you, that's it. Still the most influential person in your family. That's why the mother works the way she works, because dad ain't around. That's why mother has to do the things that she has to do, because dad ain't around. Or that's why the family is the way it is, because dad is around. The most influential person in every single household is the father. You grow up, whether you grow up fatherless or whether you grow up with a child, I'm telling you, the father is the most important influencer in the family. If he, and, and whether his children, and whether... Um, whether he's there or not, ultimately our, our behaviors are influenced by our father. So if he's a good father, then the desires of the child is to please their father. I'm not a perfect dad by no means at all. My children will tell you that I'm not perfect. But by the grace of God, I have been able to be a good father to my kids. I know that. Because when I come home, 5.30, 6 o'clock from work, I'm coming home, I knock on the door, open it up. Man, I got three kids running to me. Fabi, boom, they just embrace me. I just knock on the door. I just open it up. I don't even say, who do you, I'm home. I don't say none of that. They just see I'm home and they just run to me because I'm a good father. They want to be in the presence of a good dad. Okay? And then I have to you know, take my kids. Come on, get off of me, kid. Right? Don't toss them off me. And then I sit on the couch and I'm telling you, I'm not lying. I sit on the couch and my son will come and take my shoes off for me. He'll just take my shoes off and he'll start serving me. My son will serve me, and I, I can almost abuse of this, right? Hey, son, take, give me this. Son, bring me that. But I've tried it. No matter what I ask my son to do, they do it. <laughs> it makes them so happy to serve me. It makes them so happy to, to give honor to their father. I don't even have to. I don't have to. I didn't teach them any of that. Take a, somebody's shoes off? I've, they've never seen me do that. <laughs> I don't like feet. <laughs> But they do it because, by the grace of God, I've been a good father to them, and they want to honor me through service. Or, for instance, with my daughter. I never, ever have to beg my daughter to spend time with me. Never. And Elise, come hang out with me. I beg her? No. Every single time, Annalise, we're hanging out. What? Man, where are we going? What are we doing? And I can't even tell her too far in advance because she will not focus on anything else but that day. And when that day comes, man, she's getting pretty in the mirror. Man, she's making sure that her teeth, all of them are right and brushed. She know I don't like bad breath. Like she, I mean, she, does, she goes all out because I'm about to spend time with daddy. So in her mind, she loves it. There's, I don't have to convince her to spend time with me. And then when my kids play the worst game that I can't stand, mommy and daddy, I can't stand that game. The other day, I, I, um, I went into my kids' room. They were being very quiet. I got four kids. There's no reason why my household should be quiet. Okay? And it was just a quiet night. 
So I crept in, and I know how to walk, you know, like when you're bad and you're creeping in home late and you don't want them to hear you. That's how it is with me. I've learned that trick, I've, you know, 15 years in of walking and not, you know, making no noise. So I creep into the room, and my kids, they, they don't hear me coming, and my daughter's holding my son, like, in the bed. What are y'all doing? I don't like this mommy-daddy game. Cut this stuff out, okay? But what are they doing? They are emulating what mommy and daddy do. They are emulated, and then when my son, when he talks to my younger son, he's just like, you know, he'll tell them same things that I say. He'll start to act the same way that I act. Why? Because the father is the most influential person in the household, especially if he's a good dad. Obviously, God the Father is a perfect father. He is a good father. So his ways begin to impact us and begin to influence everything in our household if we belong to the household of God. If you belong to the household of God, it is your natural reaction to run to his presence when you know he's there. You have to, God, if God's in the place and you're his daughter and you're his son, God doesn't have to say, come to me, come to me, come to me. What? No. If you realize daddy's home, a good father, you run to him. Like the same way with my daughter, I don't have to force my daughter to hang out with me. Somebody who's been impacted and realized they belong to the household of God, you don't have to force that person to hang out with God. But so many times you're like, I got to get my Devo in. All right, God, I'm starting to counter right now. Ten minutes. I gave you five yesterday. Be happy. Okay, God, we're going to hang out for ten minutes. The game about to come on. (laughs) You know, we like force your... You mean you got to force yourself to hang out with God? But he's a good father. We should find joy in serving him. So when my kids, they, they, it makes them happy to please their daddy. As a child of God, it should make you happy to put a smile on your father's face. And then what, next thing you know, the more that we begin to serve him, naturally be in his presence, next thing you know, you start to act just like him. And what is that called? Holiness. It's called holiness because the Father's presence, who he is, his ways, being with him has now impacted you and affected you, and now it has permeated everything about you. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 tells us this, that we hate what is evil and we cling to what is good. I remember a time in my life where when I said when God called me to holiness, I loved what is evil. I used to pray for temptation as if those prayers got heard. But I love what is evil, and I used to run from everything that was good, especially good people. I'm not trying to hang out with good people trying to kill my vibe. Like, I'm not trying to do that. But God, when I was adopted into his family, now all of a sudden the things that I used to love, I hate. And when I do those things that I used to love, I feel sick inside. Like, man, God, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not me anymore because I've been holy. I've been separated from that type of stuff. So the last point is that one, God sanctifies us and makes us holy by being adopted into his household. And lastly, holiness can also be learned through godly discipline. Since you have legitimately been adopted into his family and you are legitimately his son and his daughter, he will give you a pow-pow when you need one. (laughs) He will. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 tells us this. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, so we're talking about adoption again, holiness. It's always talking about those who belong, who are children, sons and daughters of God. Do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint. Like, oh, I can't take this no more. When you are being reproved by God. Check this out, verse 6. For the Lord disciplines the one who he what? Loves. If you're being disciplined by God, that's because he loves you. If you're getting away with sin all the time and you're just not even tripping about it, you you know, you're just getting away, it's not the love of God. You have to question whether you're legitimately his son or his daughter. Because the Bible says the Lord, that he punishes the son that he receives, endures suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons, adoption again, for what son is there that the father does not discipline? I always tell my kids when I discipline them, trust me, man, I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this for your good, for your benefit. If I didn't love you, I would let you do whatever you want to do. And many of us, that's how we are convinced that our fathers don't love us because they weren't there for us. They never disciplined us. They didn't even care about our lives. So they they them to try to say, hey, you know I love you, right? No, you don't. Why'd you let me do this? Why didn't you just tell me something different? God isn't like that. He's a good God. And he deals with us as sons and as daughters. 
But if you are without discipline, then you're illegitimate sons and daughters. Verse 9, furthermore, those of us who have natural fathers, they disciplined us. We respected them. That is what trips me out about my kids. I will pow pow the mess out of my kids when they do something bad. And you know what? They come running back to me. They love me. They, they hold on to me. I'm like, what? They respect me. And I'm thinking, man, I just broke this relationship. <laughs> but I love them, and they realize that dad loves them, so it's out of respect. They respect me far more. If you do not discipline your children, watch how they disrespect you, walk all over you, and then you wonder why we see three-year-olds on YouTube calling their mothers out their names. Ain't no discipline. No type of discipline at all. But if you discipline your child, they will respect you. How much more so do we respect God when he disciplines us? We know God ain't going to allow us to get away with that. We may have been shown grace for a little bit, but we know if I do that again, it's a wrap. And we need to have a healthy fear and respect for our God, our Father. Those who continue in sin over and over and take God's kindness for weakness, you don't respect God. I don't respect God if I'm continually taking this kindness for weakness. The same thing, the same way you would say to your kids, you don't respect me. I've told you no, 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 no. And you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. You obviously don't respect me. Do you respect God? Allow him then to discipline you. Don't run from his discipline. Embrace that because it's for your good, as we're going to see right here. Furthermore, right, it says, when our natural fathers disciplined us, we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us, being our fathers, for a short time and what seemed best and good to them. But he, God does it. He disciplines us because verse 6 tells us that he loves us and he does it for our benefit so that we may what? Share in his holiness. The fact that God will say, I, my holiness, I'm separated from sin, and I want you to share in the separation from sin, that is for your benefit, it's for your good. But many times, if we're honest, we don't see holiness of God as a good thing. We're like, I want Jesus, I want to go to heaven, I ain't really trying to be holy though. <laughs> like, I don't want to share in God's holiness. I'm going to share in the holiness of the most righteous person I know here on this earth that's still a sinner. You know what I'm saying? But like I know what they usually do. I want to be holy like them. But the Bible tells us to be holy as God is holy. Some of us in here, the enemy has lied to us and told us that if we're holy, if we stop watching that, we'll be squares. If we stop doing this, you know, your life is going to be boring and miserable and you're going to hate it. If you actually were pure and righteous in the way you treat the people of the opposite sex, you will be miserable and God will punish you because you won't satisfy your fulfillment to be met. Whatever. It's just like, huh? And we believe that. We believe that if we're holy, our life would be miserable. But the Bible tells us that when God disciplines us, it's for our benefit so that we may share in his holiness. His holiness is the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. It's the best thing that could ever happen to you. If my household was a holy household, I don't care what the world says, man, I got a holy household. As for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. It's a wrap. That's it. I'm not being conformed to the ways of the world. I don't want that. And you guys have been there. You guys have done that. Try the worldly thing. And watch how nobody really loves you. You'll be lonely. You'll be beat up by the devil, beat up by the world, and people will look at you as trash and less valuable and move on to the next one. But God, his household, is a godly household. It's a holy household. And it's one that we get to share in his benefits. And the greatest benefit of all is his holiness. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.